Hello, everyone, and welcome to the last part of the BioXL uh, workshop in uh, best practices in QMM simulation of biomolecular systems. Today is uh, our panel session, which concludes the workshop. So uh, some of you who are here will have attended the webinars of our individual speakers in the, as part of the workshop. Some of you may have just come to this panel session, so I will just uh, reintroduce um, our invited speakers who form the panel today. Uh, we have uh, Maria Kranova from Novonostrov Moscow State University and the Russian Academy, the Russian Academy of Sciences Research Center in Fundamentals of Biotechnology. We've got Ulf Rude from Lund University, Professor of Theoretical Chemistry. We've got uh, Maria Joao Ramos from University of Porto, who has is in the Theoretical and Computational Biochemistry Group. We've got Adrian Moholland from the University of Bristol, um, who is at the Center for Computational Chemistry. But Janis Mavri from the University of Ljubljana and the National Institute of Chemistry, also in Ljubljana, and uh, Carmen Rovira, who is at the University of Barcelona and at the Catalan Institute for Research and Advanced Studies. Um, so all of uh, these speakers' individual uh, webinars in this workshop um, are available uh, uh, on, on our YouTube channel, and the slides are also available if you're interested uh, and not, have not yet seen them uh, on the BioXL website. As well as these invited speakers, um, we have, uh, I have my, my BioXL colleagues and co-organizers of this workshop, uh, starting with Gerrit Groenhoff, who also gave a webinar during as part of the workshop and who will be chairing uh, today's session and participating um, in the session um, as a speaker. Uh, then also my colleagues uh, Emiliano uh, Ippoliti and Dmitry Morozov uh, at the University of Uvascala and Forschungszentrum Jülich, respectively. Um, and I'm based at the University of Edinburgh. So with that, I will hand over um, to Gerrit uh, to start uh, this session with an introduction. All right, wonderful. So yes, thank you, Arno, for the introduction. And thanks all the attendants for coming and, and attending this lecture. And of course, mostly my, my, my biggest thing goes to the panelists who have already given a webinar and have now been found uh, willing to also discuss with you uh, best practices. Um, to briefly remind well, I don't think it's really needed, but you have to start somewhere. So my name is Gerrit Groenhoff, and I very briefly remind you what was the purpose of the webinar series and how we hope today uh, to be able to conclude them. So we had a series of webinars, the speakers, the pictures of which you have already seen live a minute ago, and now they're here static in a different configuration, as you can all see, um, at the zero temperature, I guess. Uh, and we have organized together, we have all been speaking together in a QMM best practice workshop series. And the first question um, when people get introduced to QMM is why would you want to do QMM? And I think for all of the audience and, and as well as the panelists, it's obvious that, that QMM provides us with a handle to study chemical reaction in condensed phases and allowing us to investigate biological matter from at the atomic level. And that is something that we would need to understand not only how a protein works, but eventually how all organisms work. And we have seen examples of that in this workshop, actually, how QMM simulations actually can be used to understand a bigger, uh, a part of a bigger problem that, that we can understand. Now, QMM, of course, what, you know, due to what we call publication bias, only success stories tend to become uh, uh, papers, tend to turn into papers. So you may think that QMM is a fantastic method and it's almost like a silver bullet, magic bullet, but it is not. And it is not because it requires quite a lot of thinking beforehand. Uh, a friend of my, mine once said that if the amount of thinking that goes in advance of a simulation would be as much as the amount of time people actually spent on computing stuff, uh, the results in this field would be a lot better. And before you can therefore start a QMM simulation, you must be aware of not just the global picture of what you want to achieve, because that is hopefully clear at that point, but you need to think very hard about the smaller details, details which are often discussed in a little footnote or in a method section or in a supporting information, not really directly accessible. And they tend to be uh, to become a little bit outshined by, by the fancy results that are presented in the main paper. Yet it is these little details that make all the difference between success or failure. So what we hope this this seminar series, as well as this panel discussion, what we hope this is that it helps you in order to decide whether or not QMM is the method of choice for the problem you wish to address. And once that is a yes, also to help you to actually set it up in such a way that the results are meaningful and to validate the results and that it is really a substantial contribution to the understanding of the problem that you set out to work on. Now, the webinars we have had, so the organization was 
consisting of these six webinars. We have all seen now actually about seven, including my own, and today the panel discussion. And the aim of the panel discussion, or the aim of this whole series is, as mentioned many before, is to, 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 to come up with the best practice, to come up with and be able to write a so-called best practice guide, which in particular helps beginners, but also advanced users can help beginners to get into this field and to kind of do a sanity check, whether or not what you do is accepted practice or not. And of course, best practice is something dynamic. It might change. Maybe in 10 years, we think of best practices in a completely different way. And the way we think it is the best, the way, the, the way to go here would be to first identify what are the challenges when you perform QRM simulations. Yeah? So what kind of challenges do you meet while setting up the QM calculation, but kind of choices for which you don't know the answer a priori, for which you often have to test a couple of options for the answer and then decide the best one. And what criteria do you use to decide which option, which set of parameters, which model system, which model Hamilton is the best one for you? So all these are challenges and all these should have a best practice that people can rely on. What I hope, but don't all actually expect, but nevertheless, that we can reach some kinds of consensus on these issues and that would allow us to actually make a very clear document that will be available in bio excel and if it's a really good document we might even consider try to publish it somewhere so that people have access it or can access it also when bio excel is long gone now some take home messages from the webinars that i wrote down is the most important take home messages so we have seen in the message of maria that uh, in order to distinguish between a reactive and a non-reactive confirmation, which is of course very important if you don't want to spend all your computational time on trying to calculate the reaction barrier for a confirmation, which is reactive in the first place, she has actually shown us that you can use the properties of the electron densities, and in particular, the second derivative or the so-called Laplacian of the electron density to decide whether or not configuration is, is reactive. Then the second seminar in the series was given by Ulrike, and he actually explained to us at least. But the, the speakers can interrupt at any moment if I say, if I take, if I put words in their mouth here. Um, that it's okay that that in order to optimize a structure, you can actually use a smaller QM subsystem. But the moment that you want to get the energetics correct, you need to include larger QM system. And he also gave a very clear. Uh, a clarification of when to introduce what residues, like neutral residues up at a certain cutoff, charged residues, maybe except the ones that are at the surface, uh, you need to include. And he gave a couple of very good guidelines on how to get converging energies for QMM calculations. Then I cannot see what I wrote anymore for Maria. Ah, yes. So what she said, uh, what she, well, well, one of the take home messages of her lecture was that, that QMM is all about compromise. And I couldn't agree more. And, but in order to choose a, co a compromise that everybody can live with, you need to do a lot of work. And very importantly, what she also said, and that is something we should all also know, but it's often even I see it myself around me and I myself may be guilty of that as well. All the information you have, or in this case, all the correct information, experimental information, experimental information that you can trust, all of that must fit with your model. You cannot selectively shop and say, ah, this paper that fits kind of well with what I found, but this paper does not, so ignore the paper. I think it's a very important message in order to guarantee that your results are meaningful and have something to contribute. Adrian, he uh, he actually said a quite correct statement that but most what, what is in most of biochemistry textbooks in terms of enzyme mechanism is probably wrong. And he literally said, uh, I checked it in the movie, that intuition and well-informed cases are often wrong too. He furthermore mentioned that based on the good agreement that you obtain without incorporating or without explicitly accounting for so-called dynamic effects, yeah, where enzyme modes are somehow coupled to the reaction coordinate and this way can drive the reaction, which is an idea that has been popularized in the, the last 10, well, not so much anymore, I believe, but has, was very popular about 10 years ago, that those effects cannot be large. Janus even went a step further, and he said that there are no such thing as dynamic effects, which I tend to agree with, and he warned all of us to be aware, to be aware of improper models, such as such a dynamic model. He also introduced us as the only one in the series to the empirical valence bond method, which provides a very cheap, computationally cheap, I mean, uh, a way to get a reference, but to get a, a free energy surface or potential energy surface, which you can then systematically improve by determining it to a higher level of theory. And furthermore, what was also interesting in your talk, Janis, was that you also introduced how we can actually get kinetic isotope effect, how we can compute those, because those are often an important experimental piece of information that you have about your system. 
And finally, uh, Karma mentioned, uh, showed uh, uh, a whole series of, 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 of chemical uh, of studies that, that her group has performed. And one of the key, or not key, but one of the important take home messages was that already in the systems where they had the sugar rings, already in the systems in the adult state where the substrate is bound into the enzyme, force fields do not provide a correct description of that adduct state. That adduct state was already slightly distorted, as I understood, in order to be able to resemble that transition state. So also here, the common practice of running a long MM equilibration prior to the QM calculation, for example, to select multiple reactive conformations, one has to be careful there as well, because it might be that the MM force field distorts your adduct state too much. Now I want to go to the next slide. Okay. So the challenges, so I'm sorry if I'm cutting away the grass of some of the people, but I will not go into detail here when you do a computation, when you do a QMM uh, project is, of course, the first question you have to answer, what is the scope of QMM calculations? Does my project, or does my problem, sorry, fit within that scope? Can QMM be used for this problem? Some problems simply are not doable by QMM. And a good example constitutes, for example, chemical reaction on surfaces, which is very difficult to cut, for example, a metal surface in a QMM fashion. So those tend not to be done at the QM level, as far as I know. Then the other issue always concerns the model structure. So you have a structure, you have a Hamiltonian, and then you have to do some sampling. So these three constitute the main beef, so to speak, of a QMM calculation. I have a starting structure that can be coming from an experiment or it can do a computational model, like a homology model, and then what? So then you have a starting structure. How good is that starting structure? Ulf Rieder showed us uh, how you can use actually QMM to improve the, the, the quality of the starting structures. Uh, but the main problem when you want to do cal QMM calculations, in particular for active and for, for enzymes with active sites, uh, in the active sites, sorry, of the enzymes, it's often PKAs are shifted. So which totomeric state of my residue should I consider? What about heterogeneity? So if the st protein structure can exist in multiple configurations, all these problems you have to deal with before you make a starting structure. And once you have a good starting structure, the next step is of course to make a Hamiltonian, a QMMM Hamiltonian. And there the question is all arises, what is a good force field? What is a good level of theory? How do I know if it's a good level of theory? How many QM atoms should I put? How many M atoms should I put? What should I do at the boundary? How should I treat the interactions, in particular the long-range interactions? All questions that, that will affect all problems that you need to address before you actually can go can go ahead and run. Then validation, we can have very long stories about that, but that is actually the key. I mean, if you can't validate what you've done, it's probably useless what you've done. Then an uh, important question concerns also the hardware to run on, and, and then once you have the hardware, of course, that determines the software that you can, can, can use on that hardware. And there also, I mean, many of these methods are uh, okay, are, are easy to use in the hands of those who have developed them, but they might not be that easy to use in the hands of someone who has not developed them. Because what a developer like us finds easy to understand might not be the most easy to understand for an average user. Or worse, often we haven't thought about all possible combinations. Maybe one user wants to use option A, option B, and option C, and we never thought about combining these options. So there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of, I would not, not call it stress, but a lot of options to choose from, and many options to choose from is not always better, I think. Um, finally, or not finally, this should have gone before actually, but in conjunction with the model and the Hamiltonian, you need then to decide what you want to obtain. Do you want to have an optimized transition state and just get the activation energy, or do you want to have a free energy? How important do you think it is to between one or the other? Does, do you think entropy plays an important role? And once you decide to sample either statically or dynamically, what is the reaction coordinate? You know, that requires again some informative, some intuitive guesses perhaps about the chemistry. But how do you check that? And finally, convergence. How do you know that you're that, that along your reaction coordinate, or more importantly, perpendicular to your reaction coordinate, the system has converged? So you can really call this a true free energy or not. <clears throat> so these are general challenges. Then our panelists, we will have asked them, our speakers, to, to come up with a, a number of issues, a number of challenges that they would prioritize. And I would now like to give the words to the panelists, to the speakers, to actually make a short statement about what they would like to discuss during this panel discussion. And I start with Maria. And now I have to give her, I don't know, Maria can simply open the microphone. So can I start? Yeah, you can start. So I was just yeah, wondering actually, if it was maybe. Sorry. Yeah, so actually, of course. Go. Yeah, of course, there are many issues that should be considered. I mean, uh, when starting QMMM simulations, but I try to focus on two of them. 
And of course, there are, well, now the focus of QMMM simulation is shifting to the uh, free energy scans, not potential energy scans, but still there are problems that should be um, kept, in kept in mind, like, first of all, uh, proper selection of the QM, QM method. I mean that uh, even dealing with the proper confirmational sampling and all this stuff on free energy surface, of course, you should properly um, calculate or evaluate uh, forces between atoms and so electron density also should be properly uh, described. Therefore, uh, I'm, I think that maybe prior to the um, free energy calculations, one should do some benchmarks uh, with uh, potential energies on potential energy surface like simple QMM simulations of the, the same model system to to study whether this method is okay and only then just to transfer to these uh, QMMMD simulations if it is required. And another point is that um, uh, biomolecular systems are really huge and they are multidimensional and uh, we cannot think of this model like that box when we, for example, choose some reaction coordinate and put uh, some maybe set of uh, QMMMD simulations and forget about the structure. Of course, we should carefully revise every structure that we obtain and carefully revise uh, the active side and also the the rest of the model system to, to, to get well meaningful results. I think that this is actually, uh, as for, from my practice, of course, we have many students in our lab and it is all the same. Every year, it's the same case then I tell them, like, you should carefully look at the model system at this geometry configuration. And they tell, like, okay, it's fine that we will do this. But of course, all the time, every year, they have the same mistake. They just uh, don't want to, to, to waste their time to, to spend much time on uh, this um, analyzing the geometry configuration. And they just want to get output files and these quantities, just put them to the table and go next. And it is really important, uh, so I will finish that um, my, my statement and that it's really important to, to to study carefully the structure of the model system you are um, studying. That's, that's all. Okay, thank you, Maria. So bottom line, check your output. Um, the next speaker in the series was, was Ulf. Yeah. Was Ulf, um, Ulf, do you want to, to comment on, on statements that you made in terms of challenges in QMM calculations? Yeah, I can shortly okay. do it. Okay. Uh, I thank you for your introduction. And you have made a perfect introduction. You have told us essentially about the challenges you need to uh, think of. And in principle, when you start QMM and calculations, you need to think of all these challenges. You need to set up the system, you need to select the size of the QM system, you need to select the QM method, you need to select the QMMM approach and the software, and you need to think about sampling or not sampling and so on. And then in principle, you need to uh, solve all these problems before you can start of it, start the calculations. And if you should, if I should select something here, then what we have thought a lot about is the size of the QM system, as you already mentioned, and the problems with the junction atoms, which is big problems. And another big problem in the setup is, of course, to decide should you do free energies or should you do single optimized structures. But otherwise, I don't need to say much about this. I look forward for the discussion. Okay, thank you, Ulf. Maria, it's your turn now to, to uh, highlight or to, to, to tell us which, why you have chosen these four okay. points as well as on the slides. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you again. And again, I thank the organizers for uh, setting up this online event. And um, just like you all, I hope, uh, I am looking forward to hearing everybody's opinions and advices on best practices regarding QMMM. And uh, in my case, basically, uh, expanding on what we do within my research group, 
uh, when we need to establish uh, how an enzyme works, basically. So to me, the big lines consist, and I told this before and it's written, uh, on the choice of Hamiltonian, on how we regard long-range interactions, how we should explore the reactional space, and whether the conformational space is totally determinant on what we want to study. And uh, that's basically it. So over to you, Gerrit. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, the only thing I do is pass the word from one speaker to the other. We could actually skip my contribution here, but it doesn't matter. Adrian. <laughs> well, thanks. Well, I'd, I'd agree with everything that's been said so far. Um, ah, done. I think uh, you you mentioned the the dynamics question. And I think it's important here. So Yana's is absolutely right. You know that this is not significant in terms of um, the catalytic, the, the rate of reaction. It's not, a, and it's not certainly not a catalytic effect. But I think um, the debate about dynamics is somewhat distracted from some more important questions, and, and actually what the role of dynamics is. And I think for for this audience, it's it's, it's very important. That they, they realize that molecular dynamics simulations are actually very important. Now that's not to, that's not to say that dynamics affect the reaction rate of the chemical step. But you know, you've got to do dynamic simulations in many cases. So you, the word, lots of the arguments, as as everyone on the panel knows, lots of the arguments about dynamics have come from unclear use of the term. And um and, and some of the arguments have not been very fruitful, um, but I, you know, I think every everything that people on this panel have said about dynamics, I, I completely agree with. Um, lots of the the problems, problems, sort of the challenges of a, a QMMM simulation are common to any biomolecular simulation, and we've heard about this. Um, correct choice of uh, protonation states. For titratable residues, um, conformation um, environment. These, you know, these affect an MD simulation, uh, and it's important to realise, you know, there may not be a right answer that biological systems are heterogeneous and exist in various forms. The challenge really is for, for a practical QMMM simulation is where you where you start from. Uh, as we've seen, you know, if you if you pick a, a confirmation that is not reactive, then you're, you're going to struggle to make a reaction happen even if you've got everything else right. Um, Kame's examples of the saccharide confirmation are a very clear example of that. Um, you can do a couple cluster ND simulation, but if you start in a chair confirmation, um, you're going to get a huge barrier to reaction because that's not how the reaction goes. Um, so. There is no magic bullet, there's no perfect recipe, and what's very important is to test your findings. And why are you running a QMMM simulation? Don't expect it to give you all the answers. And that's where it's important to validate against experiment. So can you, for example, predict uh, the rate of reaction of a series of alternative substrates? Can you predict the effect of mutation on an enzyme? Um, the, the question there of, high level QM with limited or no sampling, or low level QM with sampling. Well, it, I'm afraid it's going to depend on, on the enzyme that you're looking at and the question that you want to answer. Um, I, I think it's really important to try to get at some experimental variable, um, Yana's, or observable. Yana's mentioned kinetic isotope effects. Those can be very um, informative, um, you know, that's something that allows you to connect to experiment, potentially predictively, um, is going to help you not only get a better answer, but actually produce something that's useful to an experimentalist. Um, the other things, they're more technical, but I think the validation should come at every stage. You know, you, when, you're, when you're building a model, you want to test it. And I think we, we need to, again, this is not for the panel, but for the audience, what we should be doing is not thinking in terms of models being right or wrong, but in terms of testing the significance of your results. 
So if you change some parameter in your simulation, does it significantly change your observable? And if it does, is that a meaningful change? In other words, is it experimentally meaningful or is it a facet of the model, uh, in which case you have to pin down which is the correct choice? I agree with all you said, uh, Adrian. Um, yeah, so these dynamic effects, I think the ones that Janice, well, I think this actually would consider a different panel discussion and we should probably also invite different people for that one. Uh, so let's not uh, not comment on that. Janice, is there something that you want to, to mention now about the uh, challenges that you would like to see addressed during this panel discussion or later? Oh, thank you. Uh, yes. So I see one major problem for me in the in the multi-scale simulation of enzyme catalysis is simulation time i mean you know we have this empirical valence bond methodology that describes quantum part on the level of molecular mechanics so basically at the same computational costs as uh, the rest of the protein it's not a thousand times more expensive and at least for our monoamine oxidases we realize that we obtain convergence in terms of free energy i would say if you have one and a half nanosecond simulation time so this basically corresponds to 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 one and a half million steps so one and a half million evaluations of the force and the energy if you proceed with the ab initio qmm and uh, still then it's fine to have a little bit of a measure what is the uncertainty we can really afford uh, 10 parallel runs starting from from different starting points so and this is a measure so we can we can we, can, we have some sort of an error bar and um, there are more problems with this i mean uh, when we started our our work you know i said guys we have everything on the level of molecular mechanics we can really obtain well converged uh, free energy profiles without applying position restraint and it turned out that you know we, we obtained very very odd profiles and the reason is that correlation time for the Euler angle between let's say active side and the substrate they have very very long correlation time and it's always necessary to apply some soft position restraint in order to to prevent this internal rotations and so that will that will that will uh, that will not give uh, nice smooth profiles and i have impression that most of you guys that are doing ab initio qmmm do not face this problem because currently I think if you have a simulation of 100 picosecond, that's already a lot. So that's it. Uh, so, because still, I think uh, ab initio QMMM community will face this problem in five or 10 years when computers will become much faster. Second thing are these dynamical effects. So, this is deviation from the transition state theory. Uh, I was tacitly hoping that this story is over, you know, when Walsh wrote this, we call it funeral paper, you know, and Adrian wrote his, this Oakham Razor contribution, so that this uh, dynamical community will, will slowly accept that. But year and a half ago, we had the uh, inauguration of our cryo cryo-electron microscope and Joachim Frank was giving this the talk and during the coffee break we had a little bit longer discussion about nature of enzyme catalysis and I was unpleasantly surprised when he asked me that where where is uh, what about the the dynamical effects and so on the transition state theories it's not really valid for the enzyme catalysis. So that's it. It's a, it's okay, a hard thanks. one to, uh, <laughs> to, to kill off, isn't it, Yannis? So, and, and it so often does depend on what, what you mean. 
well, we all care about dynamics and you, you know, your simulations are very extensive in terms of the MD. And that's why we know that it's not, not important in that particular sense, because you've done that sort of analysis. Well, you know, that as you, I fully agree with you because you said that dynamical effects are minor and they do not contribute to catalysis much. Huh? You know, in enzymology, a factor of two when it comes to rate constants is pretty irrelevant. You know? So that should be clear. So 30% increase or decrease because of the barrier recrossing is pretty irrelevant when it comes to 10 orders of magnitude. Mm -hmm. Great, that's already a bit of a discussion here, which is nice. Um, so I would like to move on to Carmen, who has also provided uh, a number of challenges. Carmen? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm here. So, oh, yeah, thanks, uh, Janice, of thanks course. Sorry. For this uh, colloquium, that will be very interesting. I think it's been very interesting. Uh, I agree with my uh, previous colleagues when they uh, pointed out. Um, uh, just to add that, okay, I. QMMM is a very powerful tool, I think, and somebody has defined it as is the best of the two walls, classical MD and, molecu and classic, uh, molecular mechanics and, and quantum mechanics. But I think that also means that uh, you need to know or to be expert as much as possible in these two walls uh, to be able to, to understand the results that, that you obtain and to, to distinguish uh, what is true, real from artifacts. So uh, I would distinguish here two different type of um, backgrounds of people because uh, I think it depends where you come from, what your background, your challenges are different. If you come, for instance, from the quantum chemistry community, uh, and this is, for instance, that was my case, um, suddenly you are with a, from a system, you come from a system of 50 atoms and suddenly you are here with 1,000 atoms. So, hundred thousand atoms and you think you are losing control and things like this and you need to learn all the other aspects you know you need to learn about about the molecular mechanics wall about molecular dynamics and uh, statistical mechanics uh, flexibility of the system and all these things and these are like your challenges but if you come already from this field maybe your challenges are other ones maybe your challenge is how to choose the basis set how to choose the functional and how to do the, the QM part of the of the QMMM simulation. And uh, okay, for me coming from the QM community, it's been fascinating to to learn all the all the statistical mechanics surrounding all the uh, molecular dynamics uh, part of the QMMM, and I'm still learning a lot of it. And by doing this, uh, what, what uh, my what I have learned more is that is is that sometimes it's not it's difficult to trust. Uh, you you need to to get the initial model that is correct and you can trust. And sometimes you, we try to trust the, the experimental structure just because it's experimental. And uh, even if it's a good resolution crystal structure, uh, my colleagues that are crystallographers are always telling me, don't trust blindly the structure. Look at the density. Look at what is missing, what is not missing. And uh, and then uh, equilibrate properly this structure before starting any calculation. And this is uh, that's been a, a challenge for me. And uh, and I think the next challenge is to um, to be able to do longer time scale simulations because in QMMM I think that the problem of the size of the system is partially solved because we can treat bigger systems as much as we want. But the problem of the time scale is still the what uh, what improve, can influence uh, our results, and this is uh, of course it's system dependent. For some systems, this is not necessary. For some others, it will be. But it's uh, I think it's a major challenge, especially for when we study systems that have not been studied before, because it's different if you study a chemical reaction that has been studied for the last 20 years, and we already know the reaction coordinate. We just want to improve a little bit more, or totally different reaction that nobody has studied. Then. Uh, this is also very, very challenging, and uh, that's all. I th I think during this during this uh, session we will be able to discuss among us and answer the questions of the uh, new users and uh, knowing their concerns and and other challenges. Yeah. Okay. 
Thanks a lot, Carmen. Thanks a lot, everyone. So I think this nicely sets the stage uh, uh, to launch this, this, this panel discussion. Um, before we do, now it doesn't work again. Now it does again, sorry. Yeah, before we do, so the, the users could also contribute questions. Um, yeah, so one question is uh, shown here on the slide. So how do I prepare input for QMMM? So this is already a little bit more uh, towards uh, the, 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 the tutorials that we are organizing within BioExcel. And I think I don't know or Dimitri can usually comment on when the next one will be, because there we will address this type of, uh, of problem. Then the second question is whether or not uh, is the elastic band sufficient or not? So that is something we can actually easily uh, take and discuss among us. And finally, um, yeah, the last question is again specific. Can we actually study AFM-like uh, forces when you pull uh, uh, one protein away from another with QMMM? And that the answer, I think we can agree on probably QMMM is a little bit too expensive for that type of application. Um, then there was one question now in the comments coming by. Okay, so there the question is, what should be, what, what if someone wants to start working with QMMM, he wants to, to he or she wants to, 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 to get into QMMM, what is the focus, what should, what should he or she focus on learning? Uh, how to run the calculations or the theories of QM, yeah? So also here is something that we can take into consideration during this panel discussion. Okay, now we're back. So we see the panelists, but not the, not the audience. Still a little bit of a strange feeling, but that's how it is. All right. So I think maybe we should, this, so this is a panel discussion. So at any point, the attendees can uh, interrupt. I mean, put a question on the, on, put, put a question out. And as we had agreed before with Emiliano, Arno and Dimitri, is that uh, though your questions will then be injected into the, into the panel discussion at suitable moments. All right. Um, I think we can start then perhaps with the first issue. That is the issue of the model structure. So what is the best practice guide we would like to formulate for that based on our own experiences, based on what we have seen of each other, based on what we have seen of people doing. Also, we can maybe define what we consider bad practices without mentioning names. So who would like to start here? So let's say I'm a undergraduate student and my supervisor got a fantastic opportunity to collaborate uh, on a very high profile project. Um, let's say there are some people that some collaborators are able to, to do a time resolved crystallography experiment. And of course you want to be on it because this kind of work gets, tends to get published in high impact journals. I need a structure. What do I do next? Can I just simply take the PDB file structure? Do I have to, what do you have to pay attention to? Or better, now when you're reading a, reading a method section, that is not our work. <laughs> when you read a method section where it says, uh, protonation states were chosen according to the to the to the to the reference PKA values of the amino acid, except amino acid one, two, and three, for which we use the protonated or deprotonated state without explanation. So what would be what would be a best practice so we don't run into that type of methodology again, where it's obvious that it didn't work without the proton there, but it is not really discussed. So how would you how would you what kind of setup scheme would we consider best practice there? So who would like to start? Who would like to start sharing his ideas on that? Well, I can tell you what we do, uh, whether it is the best way or not. Uh, but I, I can tell you what we do or what I do. So I, I start before that. I, I start by when, when I'm, when I know that there is a, some sort of PDB that uh, is related to the system that uh, we want to study. I ask my student to go to the literature and I suppose everybody does that and do a, a, a very extensive uh, literature search and starts uh, going through it and uh, going understanding, as I said, and you said very well, and thank you for mentioning it, uh, that they should also uh, look at all the experimental uh, facts or results that are published and um well, well, yeah, then, you said that actually in your talk yeah yeah i know i know i know but you reminded everybody so i'm I grateful it, for that i have forgotten <laughs> already so <Oops. laughs> anyway <laughs> uh but um uh so then that they they have to go to the pdb and they have to choose the best structure 
and for that they have because often there are many uh, so good resolution they have to open it and see whether everything has been uh, resolved so uh, all the the um, atoms are there sometimes they're not obviously not i'm not talking about the hydrogens but uh, if there are flexible loops or not and uh, if the thing looks more or less correct or not uh, regarding the um, often uh, there is a, um, a, um, a mechanism that has been published uh, in the literature so uh, often by uh, experimentalists so they've got to relate one thing to the other so um, they, they do spend quite a bit doing all this I always think that it is uh, very good as I think most people have talked about to spend. I think it was Wolf actually that uh, said this this time. Uh, uh, it's 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 like building a house. If you um, well, he didn't talk about the house, but he 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 meant it. I think uh, so. It's like building a house to me. If you have bad foundations, so eventually the house is going to fall down. I mean that that's for sure. Nothing holds. So you have to spend quite some time studying your system and knowing what you're doing and what you want to do. Uh, and then when all that is solved, so to speak, uh, the student should carry on and has got to see which model is best for his QMMN calculation. Uh, and also whether what you want to do with it. Do you just want to know the mechanism of a reaction? Do you want to go on for example because we do i know many of you don't but we do uh, we do drug discovery we need the transition states and very good ones with good geometries so often we have to do uh, gaussian calculations on them or some sort of calculations you know static so to speak without introducing the dynamics immediately uh, because we need the transition states and uh, with with precision uh, as good as as you can possibly uh, have because of then uh, uh, well you know why uh, we, we just need them so we, we have to then do uh, screening on all the geometries of the transition state to model your inhibitors and so on and so forth uh, so so you have to think what you want to do uh, next but for that when for one thing or another you need a, a good QMMN model and to choose the QMMN model what we do is we should never cut uh, that's to me that's the most important thing or well, two things first of all you have to keep in your QM part all the residues that are important catalytic for the catalyst for the uh, catalytic mechanism and secondly you should never cut uh, interactions that are important i.e i don't know double bonds and uh, hydrogen bonds and uh, you know, all sorts of uh, electrostatic uh, important uh, interactions and all that sort of thing so that's what we do regarding this initial part yes <clears throat> So one comment on the on the last thing you said. So this is it's a detail perhaps, but very often you you do cut between hydrogen bonds in particular because you these are non-covalent interactions. So you it's it's very tempting to put one in the MM and one in the QM. And of course I understand that the hydrogen bond might be more than just elect, pure electrostatics because if it were that then it should not be such a problem unless the MM phosphate has been really badly parameterized. So you would encourage not to do that to to try and avoid. Well, Okay, let me be a little bit more uh, uh, precise on that. So, uh, obviously, there are times you have to, but I wouldn't do it if it is in within the active center or too near it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Uh, because yeah. otherwise, it's almost unavoidable to to have such cuts. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, I'm talking about you know very near the active center and. Uh, or in within it. So that, that's what we do. Okay, but now I abuse my right as privilege as the organizer to ask the first to, to make the first comment. I, I, I somebody else wanted to comment as well. I saw. Hi, how to comment? Yeah. Do we just raise the hand or? Um, well, it's a panel, right? I think we can shout to each other like a real okay. panel would do. So just just speak. That's easiest, I think. For the um, audience, they have to raise their hand. Uh, I'm sorry, audience, but that's because otherwise it will be a complete chaos. <laughs> 
I, like, I think I think the question was about um, how to choose the protonation state of the uh, residues that are a bit uh, ambiguous and so on. I think we all what we all do probably is to to use one of these PKA uh, servers that that uh, predicts PKAs, no, and then decide. Uh, that's always a, a good initial solution to check the PKA and add the protonation state that corresponds to the to the PKA. The problem is that sometimes these servers uh, give uh, strange solutions for residue. So I don't know. This is something I would like also to discuss <laughs> what to do in that case. No, you you just look at look at the experimental data, okay, and you know the residue needs to be protonated, otherwise the reaction will not work. But what if the PKA yeah. server gives you a PKA that is not the the right one for the reaction? Maybe the yeah. No, I, I haven't yeah. found this problem actually. Yeah. So, so, yeah. It was okay. Sorry, Garrett. The, the, sorry, Carmen. It, I, I, in the middle of my thing, I actually forgot the initial question to be that one precisely, <laughs> and I forgot. I, re I started with the experimental part because the experimental part is very important. So I always tell them to look for, you know, the the PKAs of uh, the aspartates, the, the you know, all the the, all the aspartic acids, the uh, glutamates, the. Uh, uh, even cysteines and all sorts of uh, 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 things. So that the, the experimental part is very important. And then they have to go and look at the, uh, well, they use PROPCA usually, or H++ or something like that, uh, and then go and actually visualize that on the screen and see if they, uh, uh, if everything fits together. So, sorry, I'll, I won't take any more no, no, don't worry. This was, this was still within the context of the original question yeah. because protonation, tautomerization of protons is an impo is a very important aspect. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Come back yeah. to Carmen's question about not being able to 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 know what the PK, what the protonation should be, and then I got to Yanis. Um, so what what often drives me on the wall is when a mechanism starts, for example, with a deprotonated OH OH group on, well, for example, the sugar. You know, you start with the deprotonated of a ribose sugar, for example, and you take the proton off and you start the reaction. Then I never read of another, but I often cannot find back in the article what is the, actually the energy penalty for taking that proton off. Because if you start in a state which has a different pKa than the pH of the solution in that active site, uh, then you then you want to know the answer for. You need to get you add a certain energy offset, and that will of course increase the barrier. But if you just don't say anything about it, you just remove the proton, and because then you get a lower barrier, <laughs> the people really can publish my paper. But then what does it mean? I mean, you need still to account for the fact yeah, that yeah. most of the configurations will not have a deprotonated OH group. So yeah. these are and your barrier, your barrier can be exactly the experimental mm -hmm. for the wrong reason. Your barrier wrong. could be experimental one and you are very yeah. happy with it and then you forgot an initial step so this is an artifact it would be an artifactual barrier mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yes okay so <laughs> protonation states are definitely associated with pk values so if you know the pk value of a certain ionizable group then you have an analytical expression for free energy cost to protonate or deprotonated you know, or deprotonated you know pa pk minus ph times 1.38 and then you have it in kilocalories so subtask is how to calculate pk value of of an ionizable group so you know uh, x-ray structures usually do not provide this value even not that crystallographers usually do not see protons and the method of experimental method of choice is always uh, NMR. So then you say this is signal for my aspartate and then titrate it and they got it. So it's L mild one was doing that very well. But calculations of the pK values are held on the earth. So deprotonation or protonation is is formally SN2 reaction. So we are creating a charge and uh, net charge, and this is extremely demanding. So naive attempt to just deprotonate, aspartate, and perform thermodynamic integration usually fail. So Ari Warshall in, in his Molaris actually solved that by Langevin dipoles with double resolution and 
pretty complicated. I tried to understand this paper a few times and they gave up. This is also not coded in the Q, in the Q code of Johan Pokrist and co-workers. They said it's too complicated. So uh, we were for over enzyme, for over monoamine oxidases, we, we indeed calculated uh, pKa values for ionizable residues and it took us quite some time. So it's not trivial. So uh, these uh, servers like Pro PK or H plus plus give reasonable values, but in some cases they they fail badly. So I don't know what are your experience with that. But still, proper calculation of PK values is a major challenge for computational etymology. Yeah, and the main problem arises, of course, from the coupling between these sites, because the simple concept of a pKa is a bulk property. Having an amino acid in bulk water, that is a pKa. You get a nice sigmoidal titration curve and everybody happy. In enzymes, or in proteins in general, where other sites can also titrate in the range in which you want to titrate, these titration curves are no longer sigmoidal. They can even be going up and down if you look at the microscopic pKa associated with the site. So that makes it very complicated story indeed. And on top of that, to model that, to get the dialectic response right, yeah, these are all very highly challenging problems. But the issue is, of course, that, that the answer depends very strongly on what protonation state do you choose. So, yeah, it is nice that, of course, you have to write in the methods which protonation states were like unusual, but then also, please, why? We would like to know why is it a, why was that residue chosen to be protonated? And I would say best practice includes statements in the methods detailing why were the protonation states chosen as they were. Because even if they're wrong, the result may still be meaningful, but just if you can just decide later that, ah, this is where, where this went wrong because this protonation state is now, we have now NMR data, and the NMR data clearly indicate that that site is protonated, for example, in the adduct state. Yeah, and you mm -hmm. could, you know, you could have different mechanisms at different pHs, couldn't you? But I think many of the questions we're facing are actually, they're not about QMMM. Many of these questions are about- I know, this is more related to the Given yeah, that but I've course, a Gaussian calculation before. Um, but of course, an interesting yeah. aspect of enzymes is that they tend to be, they have quite the pH, they're not, they don't have a sigmoidal titration curve like a amino acid would have. They're yeah. usually active over a range of pH values. So they have some intrinsic stability against changes of protonation. So that makes mm -hmm. them also very interesting to understand. So maybe yes. there is some, not such a bad, it's not such a problem that because maybe the protonation state is rather preserved over a decent pH range because it has to perform not just at one pH value, right? Absolutely, and you you know you go to acidophiles and um, so on that can operate at low pH, and they they probably maintain their their active site in, in the same configuration as a mesophile, but everything else is is changing. Um, yeah, I think these questions are then they're, they're not QMMM questions. Um, they're very important questions, and they're probably more important than than people freaking out about which particular sort of link atom they might use because if you know you set up your simulation wrong it doesn't matter you know if you're doing couple cluster dynamics as i say you, you'll get the wrong answer and and i think what's been clear again there's a, there seems to be the sort of the very beginner approaches you know is qmmm useful or not and then which method is the best one and that's the wrong question to ask the question should be, you know, it's like saying, is NMR better than crystallography? Well, it depends what you want to do. So the first question is, why do you want to use QMMM? It won't always be the best method. We saw one of the questions. It's not a good idea to use QMMM. I don't think anyone on the panel would think it's a good idea to use QMMM methods to simulate AFM pulling experiments. This is not, in principle, it's a good idea. In practice, we will all be dead before you get a result. Um, <laughs> it, it, not a good idea. So the, the first thing is, what hypothesis are you seeking to test? And then what is the appropriate method? And we've seen different approaches and the different approaches have their uses. Different, different strokes for different probes, but different methods for different problems. I do think it's really important that, you know, as as perhaps the protein structure prediction people have done as a community, 
they've they've set themselves the challenge of you know how do methods different methods um, uh, how do they work in terms of their relative predictions of protein structure? Now, it's useful to have you know benchmark guinea pig systems like charismate mutase, for example. So if someone presents a new QMMM method, well, let's see how it does on charismate mutase. Let's see how it does on mysozyme, because then you can compare it with other methods. And then again, you can say, well, it has a certain range of accuracy, a certain range of applicability. But the first thing, and this is not for the panel, this is for the audience, what question are you trying to ask? And then how are you going to address it? How are you going to get a meaningful test of that hypothesis? Yes. Yes, also what you mentioned about comparing. So when you're introducing a new QM interface or a new QM model or a new sampling technique, try to pick an older published work and see if you still get the same answer or not. Because it's always a very good sanity check whenever you develop a code, even for your own code. There's far too much of, you know, take a sexy protein and a new method and then you know, how do we know if it's it, it's reliable or not? It, it, I'm doing that important testing work on a well-established system where we know the mechanism and there are other good results to, to test against. That's very, very important. So if you're any student, it's a good idea to look at a basic example, a tutorial example, something like, you know, we all have our favorite enzymes, but something, you know, charismate mutase, citrate synthase, something, uh, and see how you learn the method, see how your results compare to what's been published and then take on the exciting new, you know, um, the electron laser structure. Yes, and adding into that is that, of course, for everyone among us, panelists and audience, best practice also constitutes making your input files available, in my opinion. So supporting information is almost unlimited nowadays. You can have, you have repositories where you get a DOE, so everybody can refer to that, can access that repository. There is no argument for not sharing what you have used as an input. Of course, you expose yourself, and I know some people are a little bit worried about that, but it is science, and the more open things are, the more easy it will be for newcomers to repeat your calculations uh, and learn while doing, as Adrian is saying. So this is also a nice option that we did not have, let's say, 10, 15 years ago, when sending around YAS data sets was not so, so trivial. Mm -hmm. But I also agree with Adrian that we're now drifting away from the actual QMM panel discussion uh, on the first topic. So is there somebody from the audience or sorry, not everybody has had a chance to say something. Is somebody from our panelists who, who, who still wants to make a comment or wants to say something about this initial structure selection and optim optimization? Yeah, Ulf. I want to say a little bit about the protonation states. Okay. That's a very big issue. And as Jana said, it's essentially hopeless to calculate peak value values. So what we do normally is to look at the crystal structure, try to deduce the protonation states from the crystal structure. We we look at the uh, Kropka calculations, but that, as you say, they are very often wrong. So we trust the eye much more than, than the Kropka calculation. Kropka is very good to point out residues that you should look at, but then you <clears throat> have to look at them. And what we do then, look at the crystal structure, we look for a, a, a solvent uh, buried charges, because in proteins you normally don't have buried charges. So if you have a single group that is not forming any ionic pair, it's probably not uh, charged. Uh, so that's the second thing. And if you really want to know if a residue is protonated or not, what you could try to do is to run MD simulations and see if the structure remains close to the crystal structure. If you get the wrong protonation stage, you normally get ch changes in the structure. So that's the three points we normally do to check protonation states. And then you could also say that protonation states are important close to the active site. Well, so on the surface of the protein or far from the active site, it actually doesn't matter what you choose. We have tested that a number of cases, and it is actually like that. But close to the active site, you really need to get the right protonation state. Yes, I agree. And this is already a practical best practice, I would say. 
namely do this analysis in the classical MD, whether or not your protonation state makes sense, whether or not they, they conserve the structure that you started with. Mm -hmm. Maria, Krenola? Yeah. yeah, actually, I also wanted to add that maybe simple but still efficient way to, to, to guess the protonation state is just look at X-ray structure and, well, Usually, if two electronegative atoms like oxygen and nitrogen are located within three angstrom, of course, there should be a proton between them. And then you just well have to, to choose which of these two atoms should be protonated. And also, uh, another important thing is that we should carefully check the side chains of histidines. Uh, not only because of the protonation states, but also they can be like clipped, you know, and nitrogen and carbon atoms can be mismatched. And the same stuff is about um, the side chains of uh, uh, glutamine and asparagine. And well, maybe for the X-ray analysis in general, it's not that important, but when you obtain your molecular model, the strong orientation of the amide groups can be, well, can, can, can um, well, uh, be well, uh, can be wrong in your further simulation. They derive it to the wrong results. This, this is important, I think. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Is there a press? Is there a, a suggestion for further discussion concerning the starting structures in QRM simulations from audience? Maybe Dimitri Emiliano, if you see a question related to this. Or a comment related to this, you can. Uh, there is a, quite a comment on that actually. So uh, first comment, uh, yeah, first comment maybe uh, for the protonation state. So uh, there is a question: How much difference in RMSD is not acceptable when you change the protonation states? So is there any thresholds when you you should? Yeah. Uh, do you want to the, the I think the question is uh, what uh, how how should you uh, check that your system is not falling apart <laughs> if you change the protonation state you you should check both possibilities and see which one gives the lower rmsd that's the simple answer mm -hmm. okay I agree yeah but, but not the yeah. rmsd of the whole protein the rmsd of the of the residue mm -hmm. yeah the residue and perhaps the closest residues around it. Yeah. And something I find people often, you know, they focus on an RMSD as though that's the answer. You know, look at the structure. Um, you really, there's no substitute for a still for a human looking at a structure and seeing whether you think it is consistent with an experimental observable or not. Um, you, you can't just trust to simple metrics like RMSD. And maybe another question, which is uh, connected also to setting up your system. So, if you want, uh, so some uh, yes, Kalayan uh, asking if uh, how the QM uh, methods could be used to develop a force field for MD simulations. Yeah, kind of general question, but <laughs> if someone have experience, then I did not get that, Dimitri. How QM? How QM could be used to develop the force field for your MD simulations? Okay. How QM could help you? But this is already done, no? When you have a, a ligand that is for which you don't have parameters, you need to do a QM simula a QM calculations and develop these parameters. Otherwise, it's just for simple amino acids, you already have good parameters. I don't know if the user means to improve the, the parameters that are already available for amino acids or to develop parameters for new ligands. I don't know what the user means here or the audience means. Actually, I know about the charm force field that there is some protocol that is published on maybe an NAMP website that you should um, construct a set of model systems with your molecule of interest and also some water molecules around it, it's around uh, this uh, well, target molecule and from some calculations and uh, well some quantities from it so it's like for charm it's like already uh, uh, a system protocol okay i mean if you have um uh, anything else in your uh, in your molecule that is not an amino acid you're going to have to parameterize it unless 
that parameterization exists already in the uh, um, in the literature, which sometimes it does. Uh, but uh, um, and so you are going to have to run QM calculations to find out the charges, for example, of whatever it is, the cofactor or or the metal or whatever uh, that is in your in your in your structure. And because if you don't, you can't run the uh, the, the calculations anyway. Uh, there will be an error uh, coming, and and those charges are important. If you get them wrong, you're going to get the results wrong. I mean, the whole mm -hmm. thing will come out wrong. Uh, it is very important to get them right. So QM calculations at a high level um, are necessary to do that. Okay. And there is okay. a question, a question regarding uh, this point about uh, uh, calculation at high level, QM calculation, for example, uh, to decide uh, how the active active site, uh, uh, what is the configuration of the active site? Uh, it was mentioned before, for example, by Maria, and says this calculation, this uh, high level calculation, uh, has to be done in gas phase, or there is another. Uh, uh, another approach uh, to to mimic what uh, what we are doing with the in, in what to, what is the reality uh, of the active site, and uh, um, this is more or less the question. For example, using Gaussian uh, and uh, trying to understand the active sites, the exact transition state, for example, uh, the, which kind of uh, uh, of level in terms of of uh, uh, continuum uh, models yeah. or uh, gas phase have to be used. Okay, I think this question pertains to what also Janis was emphasizing is that when you want to understand how the enzyme catalyzes the chemical reaction, you need to compare it to the same chemical reaction solution. And I believe the question pertains to what if in the gas phase the transition state is different? Then I would say there you have your answer, ah, Janis. All right, so it's a very good question. So very nice and still efficient method to study enzyme catalysis if you have just let's say gaussian available the so-called cluster model Fach Michimo in, in stockholm is using it a lot and the idea is as follows you truncate your system to active side maybe four or five residues your substrate and the rest you treat mm -hmm. as dielectric continuum so Typically, people place their epsilon of four, and then you in, and then you can locate your reactants, transition state, and the products, and then you increase your quantum region. You know, now you, you have maybe eight residues, and uh, idea no 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 thermal averaging is surprisingly necessary, and that typically when you have let's say eight or ten residues. You obtain if you add a little bit if you add some additional residues, energetic is not going to change anymore. We are using typically this cluster approach when we are examining the mechanism, and then when we say this, let's say in our case that hydride transfer is rate limiting step, then we can proceed with the empirical valence bond, uh, full dimensionality of the enzyme, and thermal averaging. So. Robert Vianello that was that joined us as Marie Curie scholar work with this approach very successfully. So it's, uh, I mean, people that are more or less just familiar with uh, with Gaussian can quite successfully proceed with this sort of of multi-scale calculations. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, I think for the interest of time, because we already spent more than an hour, I can hardly believe it, um, we should move on to the next point, and that is the Hamiltonian, so the QMMM model that we use to describe the interactions uh, in our systems. And the challenge is there, well, is of course, yeah, how to, well, I think we can maybe start with the point that Ulf uh, found the most important, is that the size of the QM region and uh, how to cap the QM region and what to do with the cut of the QM region. So what constitutes, in your opinion, the best practices for that for that problem? So what we are doing is that we do geometries with a rather small model 
and then we do this big QM approach, which normally gives you a model of 1000 atoms. And then we check that that should hopefully uh, be uh, converge with uh, respect to the size of the QM system and also with the position of the junction atoms. And of course, mm -hmm. the advantage with QMM methods is that you have the coordinates of all atoms. So it's very simple to enlarge okay. the QM system for single point calculations. So that's our system. Mm -hmm. So again, this constitutes the best practice that is easy to do in the sense, well, easy to do, but that is doable. And that would then typically end up in the supporting information. But these are important things to not just start and say, okay, these atoms are there and without further, motiv without further motivation, start running a QM calculation and presenting those results. Mm -hmm. Do the other- and then if you yeah, sorry. If you see any difference between the QMM results and the big QM results, you, you can get a clue of what you have missed in your original QM system. Mm -hmm. If they are the same, then the original QM system is good. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, so that's, that constitutes the QM subsystem size. And I, I think we all agree that it is the approach to, to, to make sure that, that, that it is converged with respect to the number of atoms you need to include. But now a more important question, and then it probably depends as much as to whom you ask as, as, as to what you ask, what is the level of theory we need for QMM? And it is of course a question that is impossible to give a general answer for, but how do you determine that what you have used is not because someone else said that B3LIP is it, uh, actually, one of the ideas was to call this workshop beyond B3 lip, but we didn't dare to. Um, but what is the, what justifies the method? How do you justify your, your QM method? And why do you use that DFT function and not another one out of the many choices you have? Uh, can I take that on? Yeah. Please. Um, so we, we do use DFT more often than not. Uh, to, to perform to for the QM part of the QM mm -hmm. and um, and what we do is we always nearly always we didn't do it in the past we do now uh, we benchmark for the um, the, um, the 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 functional to use so we get a small molecule which is or a small system sorry which mimics the uh, your active center and uh, we we do uh, a very accurate uh, well we basically um, uh, do um, complete base we use a complete basis set and do um, a couple of cluster calculations and uh, uh, we, we get a really good uh, result uh, so we perform the mechanism of uh, uh, that small system, and um, and then we benchmark uh, a series of DFT functionals against that very well, um, uh, that very accurate uh, calculation with a very high level uh, um, uh, uh, methodology. Uh, that's that's how we do. So we, we benchmark that and for different, what we find is that for different systems, um, different enzymes, so um, the functionals vary quite a lot. Uh, so if briefly is good for one, uh, it is not good for another one or it's worse for another one. And some functionals are really very badly suited for uh, some reactions. So that's basically what we do. Actually, it's also. Oops. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I don't see you. <laughs> I have the panel. Yeah. No, no, no. My, my, I, can I, open uh, I think it's also important to check the literature because, uh, of course, all DFT functions are, well, I mean, not parameterized, but, but suited for a certain type of reactions. And it's really nice to just to check the literature, to check which particular functions are good for your type of reactions because in uh, well in, in enzymes the the there are not not that many types of reactions and you can always uh, find some similar reactions from conventional organic chemistry 
also metal organic chemistry and just to, to, to use these products use if you think that is okay i mean for that type of system, just transfer it to your QMM simulations but actually as for me i think that more or less nice is pb0 it is usually working well for organic reactions and it is much better than bitter leap in that there are many works that show that for some uh, reactions like um, like nucleophilic addition, the literally, well, sometimes fails, and that might be that might be the problem. And actually, nucleophilic addition reactions are widely uh, can widely found in proteins and like proteolysis or hydrolysis and so on. Therefore, well, yeah, yeah. Returning back, well, of course, you should carefully revise the literature on conventional organic chemistry. Okay. Um, I think Karma was first, Adrian. Right? Oh, sorry. Just a comment on the. Sometimes we tell we we give the idea that different functionals give uh, very different results, but I think we need to to clarify what do we need, what do we mean by different results? Are we we not uh, solving the mechanism of the of the enzyme? Sometimes by different result we mean different energy barrier. Yeah. They, they don't work. We just mean they don't reproduce the energy packet. That is the experimental one. Sometimes mm -hmm. we use a model that is too so small that no functional is going to reproduce this energy barrier because we're mo our model is crap. So I think we need to be a bit careful with this because not that one cannot use. Uh, there are many functionals that would work that will give you your your mechanism. Uh, I think by failure, we, we, we should mean something much stronger than what we are meaning. Like we are looking at an SN2 reaction and it comes out an SN1 reaction. Or the first energy is the rate limiting and it comes the second one is rate limiting. But mm -hmm. as long as, as all of them give a, diff, a similar potential energy surface, if we are talking about potential energy, we should smooth a bit this statement that some functionals are bad and some ones are good. It's not black and white. This is what I mean. Uh, to me, the problem is that uh, enzymes usually, uh, the, the barrier usually is between, I'm talking about from an experimental point of view, usually is between 16 and 20, often 18, I mean, as an average. It's got to be, because if you translate that into rates of reaction, uh, if it is more than that, it, it will translate into hours of reaction, which no yes. enzyme can. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and so uh, if we don't get a barrier of activations that is in within that uh, those limits that that. Uh, 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 um, that interval, uh, then, and I'm talking about what we do from, because we all do different things, I mean, and we all uh, follow different thoughts of, uh, uh, of uh, in doing uh, the calculations and following and, and concatenating the, the calculations. So uh, we wouldn't be sure whether we were on the right mechanism or not. That's mm -hmm. So we're always a bit uh, uh, doubtful if, if we go uh, outside those limits. And for that, uh, we need to the, the correct uh, uh, functional, because you're absolutely right. I mean, often we're just talking about a few kilocals uh, oh, well, above or down. If we talk about two or three kilocals, that's the error of the of our simulation. So we cannot differentiate one functional for another. Of course, if one functional gives you 40 kilocal or something that is okay. Maybe that four or five. <laughs> but within two or three, uh, I would not be so uh, so taxative about something works, something doesn't work. I mean, the main the main objective is to solve a scientific problem, and sometimes I think we forget about it. Mm -hmm. I agree I with that. <laughs> I with that. I think there are cases where um, some some particular functionals will give a qualitatively wrong mechanism. Um, there are examples of that. 
So, you know, and that, you know, in some cases, all flavors of DFT will give the wrong mechanism. We, we know that. So you know, that may be a, an issue. Um, I, I think it's, it is a good idea to test the sensitivity of a, of a DFT QMMM calculation to the choice of functional. If you get a, you know, there's a strong dependence on the amount of exact exchange you include, then that that's an indication that you should be concerned about your choice of functional. If on the other hand, you know, it's the barrier or the, the energy of the intermediate is changing by a couple of kilocalories, that doesn't matter very much. And, you know, as Maria was saying, you know, most enzymes have barriers which are in between 10 and 20 kilocalories, well, they have to um, for, for natural reactions. Um, and it doesn't matter if your functional overestimates the barrier in many cases or underestimates the barrier in lots more cases, as long as the qualitative mechanism is correct, as, as Kame says. It is possible if, you know, so it's possible to go beyond just testing different functionals by doing something like exact embedding. So if you embed an ab initio calculation within a DFT calculation, you can test your single point energies. So you can go significantly beyond what's possible with DFT. And in some cases, for some mechanisms, that's that's useful. Sometimes it's, I think, probably qualitatively useful, probably useful for identifying mechanisms. But for most of the examples that we've seen, um, it, it's going to be a case, it, it changes the barrier a little bit. Um, if you want an absolutely correct barrier, you're gonna to have to do an absolutely correct calculation. And that means doing better than DFT. But usually, that's not what biochemists are interested in. For the density embedding, you would do it as a, a posteriori analysis on your reaction path? Yes. It, that's an interesting, interesting approach, actually. It's not, it, it's, well, so far yeah. getting gradient and so on is, is yeah, the the So this is single point calculations, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, Whenever anyone's doing a DFT calculation, it's a good idea to test your function. Sure. That's not obviously not limited to QM. No, no and there are many, many ways of doing it. Uh, yeah. You know, so, I mean, each of us has got uh, his or her own way of doing it, but one way or another, we always have to validate things and to make sure that we know what we're doing. And there are many ways of doing it. So that's why I started by saying that we have a plan. Each of us has an initial plan, which is different from other people. I mean, there are no rules in this, uh, in this field of science, at least this one. Uh, and there are no rules. So we have to establish our own rules. What matters is that we, we have a, 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 a correct line of thought, uh, I think. Uh, the way that we get there, well, you know, it varies, but um, yeah, okay. Yes, before going to Janis, so related to this and related to what you were discussing, Maria, about how to benchmark. So there is a question of one of the users uh, of Chao Shan, who is pointing out that you cannot perform coupled cluster to two large systems. So if you have a large no, no, molecule- No, 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 I, di I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I no, said no. that yeah, you have to- you can maybe come in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just comment very quickly. I didn't say that. It's impossible. I said you have to get a small system, small system that mimics the active center. That's what I said. Otherwise, it will be impossible. And then we do have a question. With, 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 uh, that's it, no? That was the question. question. So you need to yeah. find a small representative model for the problem yeah. you wish to. Right, and, yeah, and you cannot yeah, expect yeah. the whole, whole active site at CCSDT level uh, yeah, in yeah, order yeah, of course. to your DFT Of course, function. of course. That's not verified, that's great. Then Yanis is the, eager to, to, to mention something? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, no, I mean, at this point, I would like to mention that the very first QMM calculation like this lysozyme were obtained by experimental barriers. So people, let's say, Levit and Warshall, basically used experimental barrier for the corresponding reaction equal solution. And so they inserted it to the empirical balance bond. Okay, in our lab, we have very good experience with TRULARS MO6 to X functionals in conjunction with those uh, 
opus, basis set. So it works reasonably well. I would say it's a, it's a good level of theory to to perform quantum calculations with 50 quantum methods. And then, of course, we fit that to the to the empirical valence bond, mm -hmm. just to, to have reference reaction. Great. Okay, so yeah, again, in the interest of time, I want now to move on to the next point, and that is then, so once you have a good QM level, in the sense that this level works for the problem of, of the, uh, the problem you're interested in. Now, well, how to describe the protein? So do you want to like, aesthetically embed? And related to that, there is an important question about the periodicity. So I guess there is not a problem for Karma, who's using CPMD, but for all the others, this probably is an issue. You probably truncate, you use truncated models. You don't take into account the long range electrostatics. And of course, it is not the place, but then you can discuss how representative is a completely periodic simulation box for uh, actual simulation in water. So do we want to expand on, on, on that issue of QMM modeling? Yeah, Maria. Uh, actually, in my case, there are two different types of calculations. Uh, if I perform some uh, QMM D simulations, I have periodic cell. And uh, I mean, just the same model system like in classical MD simulation, but with the selected QM part. And uh, in this case, of course, I have cut off on electrostatic interaction and so on to just simulate this periodic system and another and then I get this uh, free energy surface and another way is to to perform in classical and dissimulation the model system composed of the protein and this water box and then just to uh, to to drop the central part I mean the protein and also some layer like six angstrom layer of solvent of water molecules and do the potential energy scan and in this case uh, it is important to to uh, calculate all electrostatic interactions because otherwise if you have some cutoffs uh, from point to point on the potential energy <coughs> i mean <coughs> during the optimization procedure from when coming from one point to another of this optimization the um, atoms the charges that uh well that that are within this cutoff can ch change and then the have these um, fluctuations of the total energy and of course in this case uh, you should you should for well all, all electrostatic interaction really it's a problem because if, if you have some kind of maybe 10 hundred uh, atoms in your uh, 10 thousand atoms in your system then of course um, it increased considerably the amount of well, well this one electron integrals in terms of system and then the 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 uh, calculations uh, well, become really long and uh, time consuming this, this is a problem so therefore you should not to exceed maybe 10,000 so in my case that's it Mm -hmm. Well, we have yes, we have those problems as well. So there is now Karma and Ulf. They have to. They want to follow up. Just that I didn't understand, uh, Maria. Would you mean uh, you were warning about using cutoff for electrostatic interaction, right? This is I mean it, it is okay to use cutoff if you have periodic uh, conditions and if you have uh, well uh, a single system without any copies, then uh, the cutoff result in this. Um, well, fluctuations of the total energy from from one to another point. No, sorry. Rotations of the total energy. Sorry, I didn't. Fluctuations, fluctuations. Oh, so I mean that uh, the point charges can come to well, can be within the cutoff distance in one point, and then you move the atoms, and they are already yeah, out of yeah, the yeah. and and then they do not contribute to the QM system anymore, and that that, that, is, that can be the problem. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Of, of course, using a cutoff is always worse than not using a, a cutoff. No, yeah. But actually, if performing uh, MD simulations, I mean, with this umbrella sa sampling technique, uh, you are not working with the energy surface, but more with these uh, statistical distributions. And then it's okay to use cutoff just to, to uh, like, well, rough angstrom, it's enough. And the, the, before. Yeah. 
Well, I think Ulf, Ulf follow up. Um, cutoffs lead always to trouble. They always get heating up. So unless you have a very heavy thermostat built into your system, you can still get decent dynamics, but it's not the right physics. So it's mm -hmm. in general preferable to avoid cutoffs and use in periodic system at least an evil summation technique or a fast multiple technique. Um, but yeah, most QM programs do not support such treatments. So that is one of the mm -hmm. problems. It's one of the reasons why Fomax wished to see D2K, because at least there we have a full periodicity accounted for. Um, so, but yeah, this is a common problem that we all have, that, that if I use a cutoff-based technique, then I get these MD fluctuations and I can only get rid of those via thermostatting. And that is, of course, fixing something with the wrong tool. Um, mm -hmm. Now I let Ulf comment. Sorry for interrupting. Mm -hmm. Mm, yeah, so we normally mostly do optimized structure and in, if you do op optimized structures and you don't have cutoff and you include the full protein and solvent, then this shouldn't matter as long as you don't calculate PQA values and redox potential. So if you don't change the net charge, then if you have a protein of 30 to 60 angstrom, then that should be enough. Why you do optimize uh, only optimize? Why don't you do also dynamics? You don't like? <laughs> yeah, we, we do dynamics if we want to calculate free energies, and of course, then you have to think of it. Yeah, yeah. But we start with we normally don't do that. We start to get the structures. True, but if you do the free energy perturbation calculations like you presented in your CQT. Um, I forgot the fourth letter um, uh, method. In that situation, how do you treat periodicity in that situation? Then it's normal MD simulations at the MM level. So then mm. we use ah, the periodic. periodic. Yes, okay. And then you yeah. perturb the end state, but then, then it doesn't matter because it's single point energies anyway. Yeah. Even though I would assume that this does add to fluctuations in your exponential averaging then, when you do the free energy perturbation steps. Yeah, but then we have full. Then we have a periodic boundary conditions. Also in the QM calculation. No, not in the QM calculation. But yeah, that depends on the thermodynamic cycle you do. Okay. It, it doesn't add. Okay, I, I cannot see it now in front of my eyes, but but I trust you. All right. No. Good. Do we want to comment on this further? Are there any questions related to this? Dimitri Emiliano? No, no questions. I don't see them. Okay. So now I actually forgot what the next point on the on the agenda was. Um, just a moment. Yeah, so now we have dealt, uh, yeah, so the QM boundary, we think we also have now dealt with that one has to be very careful and show that one can really cut where one can where one is cutting. Then the sampling. So this is, of course, always a key choice. Like, do I just want to optimize, for example, using a natural elastic band and an energy barrier? Am I happy with that? Or does the problem that I want to address require me to get a free energy barrier? And if I want to have a free energy barrier, the next step is how to choose the collective coordinates for that problem. And if I look at the comments of the, yeah, so how can we combine low level, for example, aliens commands? Do we want to sample? We want to sample at the low level, but in the end, we would like to have the energies at a high level. And everybody of you mentioned the sampling. So I think it is an important panel discussion point. Who would like to start? So who's not doing sampling? I, can I? Well, I often don't do it. <laughs> but why? So what, what, is, the, what well, is the reason I, for not doing the sampling. Uh, I think for, I think Kame, I think Kame wanted to uh, say yes, something. She's been wanting to say something for a while, but uh, I, I can say this afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. I was just answering. I, I, I can I can start now as you wish, Garrett. Your your. Um, no, no. I, it's a panel discussion. We're supposed to start arguing at a certain point, so I think it's fine. Uh, okay, carry on, Kame. I'll I'll go after. Oh, just a question, I, but I think I just like to. I think Eric said that if you want, if one wants to compute the free energy barrier, you do uh, like uh, molecular dynamics. If you just want a potential energy barrier, but I think it's much more than this. I think the proteins move. This is what they do normally. And if you do potential energy, you are doing things at zero Kelvin, and you are missing the movement. 
uh, so you may need some part of the mechanism because uh, all the amino acid is not just your, your reaction coordinate all the things fluctuate around and accompany this uh, active site during the reaction so it's, it's, it's not just a question of getting two kilocalories more up or down because you are computing a free energy instead of potential energy because the ultimate result is not the barrier the barrier we already know you have the experimental energy barrier you want the, probably the mechanism to get as much of that so uh, i don't know i don't consider doing dynamic just because i want a free energy barrier that's not the the point of the simulation i think i don't know if, what the others you know that's a good, very good point carmen you're right i mean if it's just about reproducing the experimental result then <laughs> then we don't provide much more insight. So yes, if we want to know mechanistically what is the role of each of the specific amino acids, but of course one still would be able to, to convince your experimental co-workers that your model makes sense by being able to predict the effect of a mutant where a specific amino yeah. acid has been changed and then you at least want to have these barriers in the same ballpark that it is not that each of them gives a, the same barrier, for example. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. It's, it, it's both. It's, it's not only that you want to get the right barrier, um, but mostly yes you're interested from from your analysis what is what is causing the enzymatic effect hmm. but for that yeah. maybe yeah. you would argue that the reaction part would be enough to get the enzymatic effect and you don't need to do the expensive sampling yeah exactly you i think you can do both types uh, as long as one is smart enough to interpret the results and to know that your starting configuration is good enough mm -hmm. for that fine Okay, Maria, I, I, agree, I agree with what you, well, all you said, actually, I'm not disagreeing at all. Maria? Uh, so, so um, we didn't do dynamics, uh, and when I'm talking about dynamics, I'm talking about QMMMMD, yeah, so, I mean, introducing it as a, uh, as a, a, a full calculation and rather sampling or whatever, I mean, I know Carmen does CPMD, um, but, um, the reason was because we couldn't afford it. Uh, we just didn't have the enough calculation power. Uh, it was impossible for us to do it. Uh, and uh, now we can, and as soon as we, uh, we started doing it, basically because we can now access the European supercomputers and, uh, and, uh, and for us, it was uh, very um, good to do that. Carme, has been able to run all her calculations, I think, in Maria Nostrum, which, uh, so she's got a lot of computing power, but uh, not everybody started like that for uh, some years. So we got used to running uh, Gaussian, and uh, we, I really like it. It makes me think. Uh, we also use CPMD, uh, sorry, uh, CP2K, and uh, and we don't think so much uh, because everything just runs. Um, if uh, that's my point of view, uh, uh, sort of comparing the two the two things with the Gaussian, we it's actually we actually have to get to know the structure very well, the system very well, uh, the experimental part very well. And it makes us do a whole load of things. I mean, we have to, to do it, but basically, because we, we couldn't cut corners. And, uh, and so it gives us a very good uh, knowledge of the system that we're dealing with. Uh, on top of it, uh, I already said, we need the very exact transition states. We can't get that out of uh, an umbrella sampling uh, uh, experiment. Uh, we can get approximate geometries, but I want good ones uh, because it makes my life much easier in drug discovery. So that's uh, uh, my point as well. So it all depends on what you want. With uh, static, and I'll call them static methods just because the dynamics is not involved in it. Uh, 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 it gives you a pretty good uh, idea of what the uh, mechanism is uh, with uh, all the steps that you get to go through and all the checking that you have to do as well, which you also have to do with uh, introducing dynamics, obviously. Uh, but what we started, so, so we started introducing dynamics, uh, dividing 
the two things, first doing the mechanism and then working on it, introducing the dynamics. What Carmi said about the conformational space is absolutely true. If we run into an enzyme that has a conformational, uh, uh, conformational um, uh, some problem with the, uh, then, then eventually we notice it. You eventually notice it. You start getting very wrong uh, results that do not uh, at all agree with the experiment. Believe me, <laughs> we've done that hundreds of times. And, uh, and so eventually you, re you, you, you go on to dynamics, which can be classical dynamics, and you find out about your conformational uh, uh, step, and then you overcome it uh, again. Uh, when we started doing uh, QMMMD, uh, what we find is that we know far more doing that uh, we know far more, obviously, about, about dynamics of the system, the, 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 the reality of the system, so to speak, um, introducing that, which is great also. Uh, so it very much depends on many things. It depends on, uh, and why did we start using CP2K? I'll tell you, because where we started using the, uh, uh, the high performance uh, uh, computers, uh, we have to rely on the software that they give us because sometimes it's very difficult to suggest a new software because it's bought because of this, because of that, because we don't have a license or whatever. I mean, there are millions of uh, uh, cases. So we have to compromise. Life is a compromise and so is science to a certain extent. So basically that's it. Sorry. Good. And QMMM is always a compromise, right? Yeah. It, by definition, I completely agree. Yeah. Right? And, it, and we have, you know, there are at least two axes to consider on the, you know, how much sampling one does versus the level of theory that you use. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ideally, yes, you'd be up at the top right hand corner, but you can't be. Um, so it's finding the, the polling point of the maximum insight for the minimum computational yeah. effort. And then, you know, we have to be pragmatic. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, yes. <laughs> I mean, I, fully agree. I think, mm -hmm. oh, so no, I think I, I agree with Maria Joao when she said that, um, that you immediately see when you, uh, when something is uh, wrong because it mm -hmm. doesn't agree with experiment or what you expect. But I think this is something that the beginners, the beginners underestimate because if you are a beginner, you don't see immediately because you don't look, because you just push the bottom and then you get the result and say, oh, the result is not, uh, this code doesn't work. This code doesn't, typical answer, no, this code doesn't work, I get crap, okay. Did you look at the trajectory or what? Did, did you do the heating properly? Did you erase the temperature in, in two empty steps, maybe, or typical? And because you don't look, or maybe because you don't have enough experience, because also it seems that people in this field, beginners, seem to me for the questions that I get, people is very imp impatient to get good results. And it's a complicated uh, procedure because you know QM, you cannot go to QMMM in two weeks. You need to learn a lot about the MM first. And if you come from the MM world, you need to know, know a lot of the QM world. So so just want to put into the highlight that get experience is also when it's only when it, with experience when you know when something is wrong or something is it's not is is correct no yeah. mm -hmm. good and so, concerning the transition of stages uh, also a clarification that maria joao i don't know why you say that in static qmmm you get an exact transition of state uh, because in dynamic qmmm you can also get an exact transition of state i don't know what you mean by this i think you can you can get an exact transition of state whatever you, your method is uh, within the your method you get the exact transition of state even if you do some empirical methods or um you get also an exact an exact within this level of theory well, we do the uh, frequency calculations if we are with Gaussian and uh, make sure that we are on the on the cusp. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You, if you uh, do a free energy transition state, sometimes the transition state with comp with um, potential energy doesn't need to be the same as the transition state with free energy. Mm -hmm. In most of cases, maybe it is because of simple reaction, but it doesn't yeah. need to be. 
but the way to test what in, in a free energy landscape that this is a transitional state you need to do an isochometer analysis you run a lot of simulation from that point and if 50 percent go to product products 50 percent go to reactants you get the exact transitional state so you get the there's ways to get the transitional state uh -huh, <laughs> but, yeah what about the computational power very simple and when you get potential energy transitional state you get one of the many possible transitional states there's several there's an ensemble of transitional states also but but i think for for uh, for many purposes this is this is fine of mm -hmm. course yeah, and I think now with this discussion, Carmen, thanks because we also managed, managed to answer one of the questions of the of the users about what is a structure, optimized structure really mean. I think this this pretty much nailed it down. Mm -hmm. So it's a transition state ensemble, makes only sense uh, if you have a potential energy service, but on the free energy service, of course, it is not a single point on the free energy service. Um, yes, so one important point that many of you brought up is how do you know if you have converged so if you decide not to calculate if you decide that for your problem you need the free energy barrier and you don't want to have a potential energy surface how do you know if you have converged right i mean if you use an umbrella sampling based method um, or meta dynamics based method in all these cases you need to ensure that all the degrees of freedom which are not a reaction coordinate are, are, are minimized are, or sorry are, are sampled completely right are in agreement that's the premise of the method so how do you know? How do you check for this? What what can we do to if I want to publish that this is a converged free energy profile? Error bars or what do you suggest? What do we suggest? Sorry. I think that we can uh, calculate some more uh, trajectory. I mean, for example, we can stop at ten picosecond for each window. Yeah, I mean, in umbrella sampling, and then just extend it to, for example, fifteen picosecond for each window and check whether the energy profile change if it is the same then we have already converged so i mean if further sampling do, do, doesn't change the profile then it's okay but of course you never know if you have if, if it not if not something conformational change for example happens in the next 15 picoseconds right or maybe you have to well, so this is something where best practices are very hard it's very it's impossible to answer this question i think but maybe Janus? Yeah, again, according to our experience, you need a, a nanosec to have a convergence to one kilocalorie or so. Um, but it is, of course, still assuming that you're in a minimum, which is separated by barriers that take more than a nanosecond to come about, right? Yeah, yeah, but still, you know, at the very end, you know, if you have a very complicated reaction where you have uh, gross, uh, gross changes of the charge distribution, then you know also protein responds to this you know and that's not fun since you know basically in during the enzymatic reaction you know protein is heavily responding to that so it also includes a little bit of uh, problem of protein folding and unfolding and we know that time scales in proteins are pretty long I agree, but maybe to get the answer you want, you you might not always need to have the full convergence in the sense that when you want to compare two amino acids which more or less follow the same reaction pathway, uh, amino acids in this active site where the reaction pathway is more or less the same, or at least you can show to be the same, maybe there you don't need your nanosecond to get the answer correct. But I guess that if you want to study the mutations at the surface, like what Alquist did in this cold adapted proteins versus hot adapted proteins, I think there you definitely need to go to many nanoseconds because otherwise you're simply not going to see the effects of this entropic compensation. But then you can yeah, run only yeah. MM simulations, but not QMM. I mean, if you have one nanosecond. No, it's impossible to run a picosecond at some up initial level. That is, that is, that is also clear. And also maybe two or three kilopascal mole is within the of DFT method. Therefore, well, it's not that important to get really nice convergence. I mean, it can be uh, good from the point of view of these statistical, uh, I mean, distributions. But still, the problems with potentials, well, we cannot overcome these problems. Yeah, Just so the advice now is, Maria, that if I have a, an energy barrier calculated and have an error in that range, then suggest Maria Krenova as a reviewer. <laughs> okay very good um so now for the sake of we're actually about to end this this panel discussion and and as adrian suggested it's maybe a good opportunity also now to talk about uh to to do you want to answer the question or ask the question yourself adrian 
I think it would be nice to hear from everyone on the panel what what they would like to see in the future. So I think we've seen yes. the the state of the art, um, and what one thing that is clear to me is that it is you know QMMM still requires a certain amount of expert knowledge to be done effectively. That's that's come through from the panel, and so I think part of what I would like to see is ways that we can help to automate that process to you know, perhaps that's from machine learning or in other ways that simulations become something where it's more of a tool and, and less of a, a technique um, for the future but it would be interesting to hear from from everyone on the panel I think about what they would like to see you know short medium and long term for the future of QMMM yes okay so who dares to start answering what he or she would like to see on these three terms? I don't know. I can say some native naive <laughs> comments for my from my side. What I would like uh, is similar to what I read in the document that you passed us, Jerry, about a, a survey of on um, mm -hmm. QMMM users. I think many of them were consider that there's a lack of documentation on QMMM and tutorials, examples, um, tests. And I think I would like to also to see this uh, more uh, user-friendly codes, more documented codes uh, yeah, than what it is now for the main codes that are available. And of course, uh, more computer time to be able to test more, more things. No, if I had more computer time, I would like to test a lot of things. Yeah, for my education and yeah. Well, computer time will, will definitely become more available, right? I mean, it goes, no, but all this computer time, this, uh, this European computer time, okay. But then we need, we need to better codes also parallel codes. Exactly. So this is one of the main challenges. Uh, that you, need no you need to demonstrate that your code scales up to 2,000 processors, and which is a QM, tell me a QMMM code that scales to 2,000 processors. Well, maybe your CP2K Gromo, Gromax Quantum interface. Line, I, I would say no, not CP2K, but you probably have to go to Quantum Monte Carlo if you want to really scale, uh, uh, scale up to that amount of processors. Yeah. But it is a problem. Yeah, you have to. We have to rethink very carefully how we do our calculations. Mm -hmm. String methods, if you want to calculate free energies, those are of course excellently suited for the new yeah. architectures that are being developed, even though that is not what these architectures are meant for. So now we're going to have the first three pre exascale computers installed in Europe, and the first one is coming available this year. What are we going to do with it? Is it going to be yeah. better QMMM, or will we yeah. just get the wrong faster? I mean, necessary to do something because otherwise the QMMM community will not benefit from this and this. Uh, Mainly the MM community benefits from these uh, big, uh, um, big uh, steps in uh, its scale and so on. But the QMM community seems to be a bit uh, much behind. The well, do you think that it's because that uh, the QMM community actually is not developing actively the QM programs? Do you think that could be the reason? In the uh, parallelization, uh, transform yes. to GPU, use of GPUs, etc. Plus, these things in general are difficult to get funding for because you get funding for a project, not for a developmental, not for software development, right? You need to, yeah, we discussed that I think on the previous occasion that uh, if it doesn't cure cancer, you're not going to get funding for it. But okay, um, yes, so I, I, yeah, that is that is indeed uh, what, what, what many of us uh, uh, expect. So, better documentation, that is also what comes back in the survey that people lack, lack simply the ability to independently get into using these codes then of course the challenges will be that with improving hardware uh, if, you, if your code does not keep up with being able to demonstrate scaling on those machines you probably won't get computational time so then we pour in i don't know how many millions of euros into making fancy hardwares which is probably going to be used by group leaders assistant professors who have definitely no funding available to hire engineers to make things scale or what do we then win in the end mm -hmm. okay but yeah, I also expect for the future, for the long-term future, that we will be able to go to larger QM subsystems than we are now. 
but that requires work. That requires work on the QM codes in order to be able to make use of the latest hardware developments. What about the others? I mean, what about the structure in, in, in structure? What about the revolution in structural biology? We have now cryo EM, so we're going to have much more proteins available to actually use QMM on. So I see that as a huge, uh, like a huge, a nice thing of being working That's right now that we we gonna we we go into the structural revolution in my opinion at the moment, making it possible to study a lot more interesting mechanisms than we could before because we simply lack the structures. Like molecular motors, which are often membrane bound, membrane bound, the crystallography does not give us the structure, but cryoEM does, and that provides the starting point for doing QM and all kinds of other analysis uh, with the computer simulation. Yeah. Can I sort of yes, please, answer, because I'm running out of words. Answer Adrian's uh, question. What I think I would like to see, but I don't know how. <laughs> so uh, I would like to be able to predict the catalytic power of enzymes, and uh, maybe machine learning is the way to go. Um, I think. Uh, enzymes are so different from each other that I'm not quite sure that machine learning is there yet uh, to be able to solve that, but it, it definitely, I think, will play uh, uh, a big role uh, in the future. Meanwhile, I think we're going to have to uh, simulate our systems uh, to become as real as possible. So dynamics will definitely have to be involved uh, and, uh, and systems will become bigger and bigger. QM part of the QMMM will become bigger and bigger. Uh, and uh, I don't know, I can't predict the, the future, but that's what I would like to. And <laughs> Karma is absolutely right. We'll have to have more tutorials, more explain better what this is all about and uh, which at the moment is just something with no rules uh, which is very difficult for the newcomer uh, it's all very well to have a student and then say, tell him or her you know well this has got no rules like i often say to my students and i just see a blank look in their face and say oh yeah good now what uh, you know so anyway that's Mm -hmm. I didn't answer any question. I know Adrian. I'm sorry, but um... <laughs> and and this is just a, is licensed to speculate, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. What about the other way around? So when often when you read the ideas about enzyme design, it basically means that the user has to think which amino acid he wants to change, and then you can do a quick automated QM calculation to see the effect. But you can turn this the other way around. You can actually make a Make, a, make an algorithm that actually, you know, you put in what you want. I want the barrier to be as th this low, which amino acid do I have to change? I mean, I think those are the future and those applications where the QMM is just a scoring function of a larger program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That will benefit from the massive, from the largely, from the, from the, from hardware becoming available that is as massive as, as the new Lumi computer that will be installed very soon. Or is already being installed at the moment. So I think we have to probably think about other questions than what we have been doing so far in order yeah. to make use of future yeah. resources. So in that sense, I envy many of the attendees because they are still at the beginning. They have still all these things to be done. Whereas I'm already feeling like, well, I have to start maybe thinking about ending this off somehow. But okay, with Maria, you want to say something? Okay, no, okay. Yeah, okay no? thank you. Ah, oh, no, sorry, Jan. Yeah, I, I mixed you up. Sorry, how could I? No, no, actually, yeah, I wanted to, I, I totally agree with Marie about that. Yeah, there, there are really no, no strict rules in QMMM simulations, and now it's still more like art, like somebody, well, everyone that uh, who's involved with this uh, field has, it, well, has its own, you know, some small rules, some know-how, tips, and uh, well, of course, it will be really nice if we ha can somehow generalize these rules and make some forward, you know, uh, directions to 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 perform at least some uh, typical simulations in QMMM. It, it would it would be really nice, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. And now, Jana, sorry, it's your turn. I have... <laughs> 
Yeah, I think that uh, you shouldn't forget about the amount of information concerning mutants, you know. Genomic medicine is these days producing enormous amounts of data. Still, you know, over understanding is still close to zero and definitely we need the multi-scale simulation for that. So our bright student Alia Prach just start, started studying monamine oxidase A, you know, a catalyzed decomposition of, uh, of serotonin and if you have a couple of point mutations then this enzyme becomes ineffective and uh, so that's Dutch know-how, Brunner syndrome. And you have severe, severe cases, and, you know, psychiatry. So I still think that in the future, when it will come to this, to, 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 to this sort of data, it's essential to combine this QMMM, what we are doing here, and some sort of machine learning. And this is still a relatively empty field. Okay. So, a little bit to my own surprise, we managed to fill up the time because I was kind of concerned when uh, Arno booked it for two hours, but it's <laughs> fine, quite fine. Um, yeah, because I think people have other appointments, including including myself. Um, I think it would be nice, uh, as Arno suggests, if, if each of us would give a short closing statement on, on what we have discussed from his own or her own perspective. And we use that as a kind of a wrap up. All right. So what do we how do we want to wrap up? So I would actually consider that we have reached quite some consensus on how we set up a starting structure. We also concluded that actually starting structures on their own, in particular considering proton tautomerization, heterogeneity, that would require a whole panel discussion and perhaps a whole webinar series on their own. These are things that are absolutely not trivial. And I think what is important is that, that people mention when they write a paper, what was the motivation for choosing the structure that they have that they have used so after setting it up the way it was set up and it would also be good if people make a common habit of sharing those structures so let, let your input structure be part of the supporting information so that others can do something with it if they wish we talked about the hamiltonian and i think that also the consensus is is, is how we can validate our sizes when we choose qm subsystems uh, QM boundary, all plus not much conflict on how to do that. We all kind of agree that, that one has to be careful there and that one has to demonstrate beforehand that the QMM setup at the QMM division makes sense, is chemically relevant. And it's not just it happened to work for this QMM system, so we go ahead with it. That is how we used it. That is how I have used how we've done it in the past, simply because there was no way of extending the QM subsystem uh, back then. We have talked about sampling, so that depending on the question you wish to answer, you may or may not want to incorporate the dynamics of the protein. So sometimes it's enough to get an answer by just optimizing a transition state as, as, as Maria uh, uh, is using in her work for cluster models or for onion models. Sometimes you prefer to run uh, free energy calculations and then get the, the, the free energy barrier. And it really depends on the question you wish to answer. And as Carmo correctly pointed out, um, whether or not there is an error in, for example, your QM model or your DFT model, um, but it's not important that the error, I mean, the answer is going to be wrong anyway. I mean, the question is, is the error small enough to answer the question that you wish to address? And if that answer is a yes, of course, you need to convince yourself and the reader of that. And I think you can, you're free to go ahead. Um, yeah, we did not really touch upon soft and hardware because I think that is also very picky because everybody has his own favorite software. But what I think we do agree on is that these software packages require further documentation, that they require further tutorials so that beginners in particular would have an easier time getting into this field. But I must also say that this is not an easy method in the sense that you need to not only understand molecular mechanics, physical mechanics, you also need to understand quantum mechanics or quantum chemistry at least in order to get started. So a little bit of, no, a little bit, quite some homework, quite some pre-work is required before you can go ahead with QMM. But once you have all that pre-work, then yes, maybe a bit more documentation from the side of the QMM and developers would help uh, uh, a lot. So let's let's give the uh, a pan at attendees a, a chance once more to to still ask a question if they they have still one. So I see. Oh wait a minute. It would be good for all of the speakers to write a detailed review on QMM together. Oh, who wants oh. to help me write? It? <laughs> okay. Well, I can say yes. That is a good idea. Whether we will do it, of course, that doesn't depend <laughs> on that. because writing reviews is quite a lot of work. But yes, we can consider that. Maybe anyway. By the way, so for the for for for. Uh, uh, 
Ching Hao Ya. The question uh, is uh, here the, 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 for asking a question. What I can answer is that we will post a best practice guide based on, on these discussions, based on these webinars uh, on our BioExcel uh, website. It's one of the deliverables that we propose to deliver. So there will be something written. Whether or not this is review quality, we'll see, but something will be done. And that could be the basis of a review in, in, in the data stadium. We'll see. And yeah, there is also, can you suggest resources to learn QMM as a beginner? Um, yeah, this comes back to what Carmel was already pointing out, is that we lack, in general, a little bit of documentation. At least there's a lot fewer documentation, a lot fewer tutorials available for QMM than there are for normal MM. But this is hopefully going to be improved. And check our BioXL website for tutorials with Chromax and with CP2K on QMM. And then the last question is thanks. Okay, so welcome. <laughs> So we should probably wrap up there. And I would like to take the opportunity yeah. again to thank everybody um, because no people need to go. So thank on behalf of BioXL and all the attendees, thank all the speakers for your webinars and for this panel. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye.